Section 1.1 is our introduction to statistics. Here we're going to look at sampling methods. We're going to learn how to construct a simple random sample, determine when samples of convenience are acceptable, describe stratified sampling, cluster sampling, systematic sampling, and voluntary response sampling, and then also distinguish between statistics and parameters. We start with some terminology. First, we need to look at the definitions of statistics. Statistics is the study of procedures for collecting, describing, and drawing conclusions from information. This is the definition of statistics that has to do with what this course is about. And when you do research, this is the statistics we're talking about. We're going to learn towards the end of this section that statistics, the word statistics, could also be a numerical value. So you don't want to confuse the two. The procedure for collecting, describing, and drawing conclusions from information and the statistic that is going to be introduced towards the end of this section. A population is the entire collection of individuals about which information is sought. For example, if I wanted to know something about incoming freshmen at MCC, then my population would be all freshmen at MCC. However, if I wanted to know something about all community college freshmen, I could use MCC as my sample. A sample is a subset of a population containing the individuals that are actually observed. It's important that the sample mirror the population and all of the important characteristics. Because if that doesn't happen, you might get something like this. Do you remember seeing this picture in your history book? Maybe it says, Dewey defeats Truman. This is the Chicago Daily Tribune. This was the headline that ran after the 1948 election. The trouble with this headline was, or how it came into being, is that the Chicago Daily Tribune needed to go to press so that they could be the first paper out with the election results in 1948. However, the, all of the results weren't yet counted for the voting, so they had to make a decision. Was Dewey going to win or was Truman going to win? They did a telephone survey in 1948 whereby they selected a random sample of people of telephone numbers, called people and asked them who they voted for. Based on the results of that telephone survey, they showed that Dewey was going to win the election hands down, that he was going to beat Truman soundly. What's the problem with this telephone survey in 1948? They did, in fact, use a random sample, which you'll find later on is very important. The trouble is, their random sample did not mirror the population as far as the population being, being the Americans that would vote in 1948. In 1948, think about the economy. We were just coming out of World War II. Not everybody had a telephone. As a matter of fact, in 1948, a lot of rural America still didn't have electricity or running water. So whenever you look for a sample to represent your population, it's important that your sample mirror the population in all of the important characteristics. In 1948, their telephone survey only included wealthier people who, had, who lived in big cities or had modern conveniences. They didn't take into account rural or poor Americans, and therefore they got a very skewed result. They introduced bias into their survey through a confounding vari variable, and we'll learn what those definitions mean as we progress through this chapter. Objective one is for us to learn how to construct a simple random sample, or at least understand what a simple random sample is. A simple random sample of size n is a sample chosen by a method in which each collection of n population items is equally likely to make up the sample. If we have a population here, our subset of the population needs to mirror the population on an all-important characteristics. So for example, if I wanted to take a random sample of MCC students and survey them and find out what their ESAP test score was, then if the student body has 60% female and 40% and male, my sample needs to consist of 60% female and 40% male so that my sample mirrors what's going on with the population. A simple random sample is analogous to a lottery. Suppose that 10,000 lottery tickets are sold and five are drawn as the winning tickets. Each collection of five tickets that can be formed is equally likely to comprise the group of five that are drawn. So no matter who you are that bought a lottery ticket, you have an equally likely chance of being selected as the winning ticket if I'm drawing five winning tickets. 
Here's an example problem for simple random samples. It says a physical education professor wants to study the physical fitness levels of 20,000 students enrolled at her university. She obtains a list of all 20,000 students numbered 1 to 20,000 and uses a computer random number generator to generate 100 random integers between 1 and 20,000, then invites the 100 students corresponding to those numbers to participate in the study. Is this a simple random sample? The answer is yes, because every student at the university had the same chance of being selected. In this example, though, the professor in the last example now wants to draw a sample of 50 students to fill out a questionnaire about which sports they play. The professor's 10 a.m. class has 50 students. She uses the first 20 minutes of class to have the students fill out the questionnaire. Is this a simple random sample? The answer is no, because unless you're in her 10 a.m. class, you don't have a chance of being selected for the survey. So in a simple random sample, if your population is somebody, like for this one it was the 20,000 students at the university, every, 50, every sample of size 50 has to have the same chance of being selected. In this case, this is not a random sample because only the students in her class could be selected to participate in the survey. This also runs the risk of introducing bias. Because she's a physical fitness instructor, there's a chance that all of her students participate in some sort of sport. If she were to take a random sample of 50 students across the college or the university, there's a good chance that many of those students don't participate in any sports. And she loses out on that, and she introduces bias, and she's more likely to have students who participate in sports if they're in a physical fitness class. Next, we look at determining when, the sam when a sample of convenience might be acceptable. In the last example, that instructor, by using her 10 a.m. class, used a sample of convenience because that was a convenient group of people to study. In some cases, it's difficult or impossible to draw a sample in a truly random way. In these cases, the best one can do is to sample items by some convenient method. A sample of convenience is a sample that is not drawn by a well-defined random met method, such as a random number generator. In this example, we're told that a construction engineer has just received a shipment of a thousand concrete blocks. The blocks have been delivered in a large pile. The engineer wishes to investigate the crushing strength of the blocks by measuring the strengths in a sample of ten blocks. Explain why it might be difficult to draw a simple random sample from the blocks. Well, if all those thousand blocks are set in a pile, and we numbered each block one to a thousand, and then use a random number generate to, generator to um, come up with a sample of ten blocks, what if one of the blocks you needed was in the middle of the pile underneath a ton of other blocks? It doesn't make sense there to use a random number generator. It's possible to just take the first ten blocks that are next to you so that you can measure their crush strength. A sample of convenience would be okay here because odds are all of these blocks were made at the same place at about the same time with the same material, so they should have the similar crushing strength. A general rule of thumb is that if you're looking at a manufacturing process, a sample of convenience might be okay. But anytime you're dealing with individuals, people's personalities, you do not want to use a sample of convenience. Don't just walk down the hall and grab the first 10 people you see and ask them to participate in your survey. When it comes to people with their idiosyncrasies and bias, it's best to use some sort of a randomized method for picking participants for your research. The problem with samples of convenience, especially with people, is that they may differ systematically in some way from the population. If it's reasonable to believe that no important systematic difference exists, then it's acceptable to treat the sample of convenience as if it were a simple random sample. For example, with the blocks, the concrete blocks that we had above, it's reasonable to believe that there's no important systematic difference because all of the blocks were manufactured at about the same time with the same material on the same machines using the same process. Objective 3 says to describe stratified sampling, cluster sampling, systematic sampling, and voluntary response sampling. In stratified random sampling, the population is divided up into groups called strata. Then a simple random sample is drawn from each stratum. Stratified sampling is useful when the strata differ from one to another, but the individuals within the stratum tend to be alike. For example, if I have a group and I wanted to study something that was based on gender differences, if I have divided my population into women and to men, then those would be my strata. 
or my groupings there for the stratified sampling and then I take a random sample from each of the groups that I have or each of the strata and that would be an example of stratified random sampling so in stratified random sampling we take some a random sample or some of the participants from all of the groups so for stratified sampling we take a random sample from all of the groups so we take some from all groups here's another example of stratified sampling a company has 800 full-time and 200 part-time employees so that means they have a thousand employees to draw the sample of a hundred employees a simple random sample of 80 full-time employees is selected and a sample of 20 part-time employees is selected notice that 8 to 2 ratio for all of the employees is still held in our sample 8 to 2 80 to 20 when we're looking at a tenth of the employees so our strata would be full-time versus part-time employees and then we take our random sample or sum from each of the groups that would then form our stratified random sample of a hundred so we take sum from all of the groups cluster sampling on the other hand is similar to random uh, stratified random sampling in that we divide our population into groups so in cluster sampling items are drawn from the population in groups or clusters cluster sampling is useful when the population is too large and spread out for a simple random sample to be feasible an example of this would be around election time we divide our, our area or region into precincts voting precincts and if you've watched TV when the polls come in they say so such and such percent of precincts reporting what they're using is a cluster sampling so if the voting area is divided into precincts they'll select some of the groups some of the clusters and then count all of the votes within those clusters we randomly select some of the clusters and then choose all of the members in the selected clusters so the way that I keep this straight is with cluster sampling we take all of some groups so we select all from a random sample of some of the groups this is similar yet different to the stratified sampling because you've divided the population into groups but in stratified we take some from all of the groups in cluster we take all from some of the groups here's another example of cluster sampling it says to estimate the unemployment rate a government agency draws a simple random sample of households in a county someone visits each household and then asks how many adults live in the household and how many of them are unemployed what are the clusters here well the clusters are how we divide the population into groups in this case we're using households for our groups this is a cluster sampling because we're not going to every house we're just going to a random sample of houses or some of the houses so we select a random sample or sum of the houses then we survey all of the adults within that household if the government agency wants to survey households or in, a, in the town about unemployment level you may have adult children that have moved back home and if your house is selected they're going to go to your house and ask about every adult living in that house and their employment status so this would be a cluster sample because we divided the population into groups of households and then we survey everybody within the household as opposed to stratified sampling where we would in a, if this were a stratified sample we would survey every household and just ask about maybe one adult in the household not every adult so you see we divide the population into households select a random sample of households and then survey every adult within that household and that's what makes this a cluster sample so for stratified sampling we take some from all of the groups and for cluster sampling we take all from some of the groups another type of sampling is systematic sampling in systematic sampling items are ordered and every kth item like third fifth ninth thirteenth item is chosen to be included in the sample systematic sampling is sometimes used to sample products if, as they come off an assembly line in order to check that they meet quality standards so for this example if I have the string of men here it looks like I'm selecting every third man because there's one two three one two three so forth and so on you just have some sort of a repetitious pattern that you use for systematic sampling 
In this example, we're told that automobiles are coming off an assembly line. It is decided to draw a systematic sample for a detailed check of the steering system. The starting point will be the third car, then every fifth car after that will be sampled. Which cars will be sampled? Well, we know we're going to get the third car, and then if we take every fifth car, 3 plus 5 is 8, 8 plus 5 is 13, 13 plus 5 is 18, so forth and so on, and you can see in this graphic what that's going to look like. We start with the third car, then we take the eighth car because that's the fifth car down the line, and then add 5, the next fifth car would be 13, and the next fifth car, so forth and so on. That's systematic sampling. You have a system that you're using. Voluntary response sampling is rarely a good idea. They're often used by the media to try and engage the audience. For example, a radio announcer will invite people to call the station to say what they think. Voluntary response samples are never reliable for the following reasons. First, people who volunteer an opinion tend to have a stronger opinion than what is typical in the population. And second, people with negative opinions are often more likely to volunteer their response than those who just don't care. Let it go. Voluntary response sampling usually introduces bias because you only have a small segment of the population that's choosing to respond. And it's usually people that feel negatively about something. Finally, in Objective 4, we're going to learn to distinguish between statistics and parameters. Remember when we looked at the first definition of statistics, I said that it was a method of collecting and organizing and describing data? Statistic as a number, though, is a number that describes a sample. A parameter is a number that describes a population. So these are two new words that you need to add to your vocabulary. So populations, which is the entire group, have parameters associated with them. That's a numerical measure of a population. Samples, the subset of the population, has a numerical measure that we call a statistic. Let me show you an example of some things that you need to know. For every measure that we have in the population, we have a corresponding measure in the sample. So for example, one of the measures we're quite often interested in is a mean or an average value. If we're talking about a population parameter for the mean, we use this Greek letter mu, and look at how I write the letter. It's it's a looks kind of like a cross between an M and a U. Well, guess what? We pronounce that mu. That's how it's pronounced. Our corresponding sample statistic is an X with a bar over it, and we read that X bar. Another measure that we're interested in quite often in statistics is something called the standard deviation. You don't have to know what this number is right now. I'm just going to give you the variables that we use to represent the standard deviation. In chapter 3 we're going to look at how we describe how we find a standard deviation and what it is. The population parameter for a standard deviation is a lowercase sigma. You draw it like I just drew this one. This is pronounced sigma. What I'm writing in green is how you would say the symbol that you see in blue. Because unless your mind thinks in symbols, you need a word to attach to this symbol. This is a lowercase Greek letter sigma. This is a lowercase Greek letter mu. The sample statistic that we use is a lowercase s. The square of the standard deviation is a measure called the variance. The way that I would represent the population parameter for the variance is a sigma squared and for the sample statistic it would be an s squared. Another measure that we look at in statistics is a proportion. In the population parameter we just use a lowercase p. This is a lowercase p just like you learned how to write in kindergarten. For our sample statistic for a proportion we use the lowercase p with a hat over it and this is read p hat. This was sigma squared and then s squared. You need to memorize the population parameters and the corresponding sample statistics. When you're reading somebody else's research, if they use mu equals a number, you know that they're talking about a mean and it's for the population. But if you see x bar equals a number, you know that that number comes from a sample of data because x bar is the measure of the mean reserved for a sample, not a population. Which of the following is a statistic and which is a parameter? 
the number here is going to be either the statistic or a parameter. In order to decide if that number is a statistic or a parameter, we need to know does it come from a population or a sample. Use alliteration here to help you. Population starts with P, parameter starts with P. Sample starts with S, statistic starts with S. If you're talking about the entire group of things that you're interested in studying, then you're talking about the population. But if it's a subset of the group, then that's going to be a sample. So here in this first example, we're told 57% of the teachers at Central High School are female. There's nothing in this statement to indicate to me that I'm interested in any other high school. So if they're telling me this number, that represents all of the teachers at Central High School. So in this case, this would be a parameter because my population would be Central High School. In the next example, we're told in a sample of 100 surgery patients who were given a new pain reliever, 78% of them reported significant pain relief. The number of interest here that's a proportion, a proportion is just another word for a percent, 78%. Does the, the question is, does this number represent a statistic or a parameter? Well, is there anything in the problem that indicates that we're looking at a sample as opposed to the population? And the answer is yes. Because of this word sample right here, we know that this is a statistic. So the 78% here would be a statistic, whereas the 57% here is a parameter because our population, this number represents the entire population of Central High School. I know that I'm dealing with a subset of the population here because I was told that I had a sample. So after you go over this section, when you do your homework, you should be able to know what a statistic is, the difference between population and sample, what is a simple random sample, when samples of convenience are acceptable, and the difference between stratified cluster, systematic, and voluntary response sampling. You also need to know the difference between a statistic and a parameter. Remember, statistics come from samples, parameters come from the population. And that wraps up section 1.1.